Well, there it comes. Comes. Here it goes. Check, yes. check. Woo. We got, we got oh, we got sound. Hey. Everybody everybody, want to try the mics again? Check. One, two. Dustin, why are you so quiet? What's that? You, you're a little, little, little quiet. A little quiet? All right, there we go. That's better. Okay. Can you guys hear me out there? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? I only see two thumbs. That's it. I see thumbs. I, I, oh, I see two thumbs. Okay. Right. I nice. see the doors closing. That's so a, that's I think that's our sign. cue to go. Okay. I hope everybody so far has had a really good time at B sides Charm 2018. Yeah. Yeah. There, right, we go. there we go. There it is. I really like this event. Um, it, it's been a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun here so far. So everybody, welcome to Between a Sock and a Hard Place. We're going to start with some introductions, um, just so that you guys get a chance to know the people up here on this panel a little bit. First up, we have JP over here. That's a much older picture. It's not that old. <laughs> the kids were, sti were, were still teenagers, and then this happened. So, so been around for a while. I was just looking this morning and realized that my first InfoSec job, the first thing I did was in 1986. Implementing uh, Army Regulation 383. I was four. I wasn't born. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's a little while ago uh, while I was on active duty, stationed at an Army base that no longer exists uh, in northern Germany, uh, making sure. And the, back then, the Army Regulation about uh, it was called Automated Data Processing Security was all about personnel security, and it was uh, it was aligned towards uh, very similar to the Ar the Nuclear Surety Program. So we had to go around making sure people who touched automated systems had their medical records flagged, and we got notified if they got any weird medications prescribed. Nothing about network security or anything like that. Long time ago, and then it involved CPM machines. Anybody ever do any work on a CPM? Ooh, all right, there we go. Yeah, I'm that old. All right, next. So what are you do well, what are you doing now? Uh, right now, I am working uh, in a DoD space, uh, kind of help helping to mentor a uh, special mission SOC, um, doing it as a government contractor. Yes, I'm one of those. Um, so, uh, and helping to mentor and making sure that, you know, folks get trained, get, you know, we keep innovative and keeping on top of things. Does that help? That Am does, thank you. That's good. All right, well, next the up, talking stick. we have oh, oh, that Andrew guy. Marini. So my name is Andrew Marini. I've been working in the cybersecurity world now for what, like nine-ish, ten years, something around there. I Ish. went to school right out of college, uh, right out of high school for a network administration degree up in Pittsburgh. That's where I'm from originally. But went to school as network administrator because I wanted to be one of those server monkey guys working in server rooms, you know, running cables. Quickly realized that everyone wants experience but refuses to give refuses to give it to you. So met Sean in college, been friends for a long time, and he ended up going down the security side of things. So I called him up one day. I was like, hey, can you get me into, you know, where you're working at, which was an MSSP. He got me the interview. The interview was quite simple. It was just like, where do you put a router or where do you put a firewall and a network diagram? And they're like, what's port 53 and 80? Okay, you have a job. So coming out of the, coming out of the gate in, as a, a junior level analyst, worked my way up coming moving down here from Pittsburgh uh, worked in everything from government socks to private sector socks to an MSSP and most recently I stepped into the world of it being a senior engineer and I got married um, so right now I'm a, a D, another DOD contractor working uh, as a senior uh, security engineer on a couple of security tools thank you Dustin I think I have the best picture I, I think so. It has beer. That's Full Tilt Beer. If you don't know anything about Full Tilt, uh, they're a brewery out of Baltimore. I'd no ads. Checking them out. All right, that's the caveat. <laughs> uh, I've been doing stuff in socks for a long time. I started off as an analyst, and then uh, I had a couple customers ask me to build a sock for them, so that's kind of where I'm at now. I uh, go around. I'm also a contractor uh, building socks for government and industry clients. And my wife's here. I want to give a shout out. It's her first conference. Uh, so here. Thank you. Thank you. And in this case, I'm definitely saving the worst for last. That's me. 
Um, I am the dreaded manager at this point. Um, I used to do breach consulting. Really what I want to take time on is not to focus about myself for my nine years, but I want to give a shout out to a hacker space over in Severn, since this is B-Sides Charm, unallocated space. Uh, I host and manage the InfoSec classes there every other Thursday completely free. So for anybody who's interested in learning some stuff, we have a bunch of different instructors come in and talk. Um, I also have a Twitter at understudy77, and I really suck at Twitter. So that's worth knowing. So now that that's out of the way, we can kind of get into it a little bit. So let's get started. What is a SOC anyway? Andy? Oh. Well, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to so, go there? I mean, I guess we can go over there. So a SOC, Security Operations Center. I mean, you have everything from you have your government SOCs, you have your private sector SOCs, and then you have your MSSP SOCs. So I think we're going to go down like, so you, a SOC in general, right, it's a... A group, a, team, a, group, a group of teams that is designated to protect something. If it's, if it's a government, uh, government SOC, it's... We'll get there. Wait. Yeah, yeah sorry. Slow down. Sorry. I apologize for going quick because I didn't know I was presenting this slide. <laughs> <laughs> I like putting people on the spot. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the heads up. But yeah, so a security operations center, group of people trying to protect the network in some way, shape, or form with some oversight, maybe. Perfect. And we have one big disclaimer here. Not all operation centers are created equally. Analyst capabilities, these things vary wildly from place to place, including what you're going to see on this next slide, which is what Andy was starting to talk about. The three common types of SOCs, highly oversimplified. First up, we have government. I think that's my turn. It is. So government SOCs have, uh, have the responsibility of ensuring uh, protection of national security assets. Um, sometimes it's national... Um, not always national security, but national assets primarily. I mean, could Department of Agriculture, anybody here? Depar shout out for Department no. okay. um, <laughs> they, They're protecting their stuff too. So it's, it's not necessarily, when people think of national security, they generally think of the classified realm and things like that. But, uh, you know, all government agencies, uh, even, whether it's federal or state or local, have some responsibility protecting the data and protecting the mission that they're charged to do. Uh, having worked for nine years in the commercial world, it's a lot different because in the commercial world, it's profit and loss, making sure in, you know shareholder value, value. But in the government world, we're really working on ensuring um, you know the national assets. And that's why next up is private sector. Yeah, so private sector. <clears throat> Um, typically, when you're working in a private sector SOC, when government SOCs are just an additional government entity, while in your in the private sector, what's a company's primary goal to make money? And as a, in a private sector SOC, you're typically going to run into things like you're protecting IP, you know, you know anything that you know data loss prevention stuff like that. So you don't want any of the company secrets getting out. But the difference between government SOCs and private sector is you aren't making the private sector company any money. You're just a big red mark on their yearly budget, so that's always a big concern. So just you're there protecting their information so it doesn't get leaked out to somebody else trying to steal a prototype or whatever. But you're always looked at as you're costing me money. You always need to have... Not always. Well, I mean... But I, 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 companies that have been burned will will realize that maybe perhaps it's a good idea to invest Eventually they bit. do, but typically you're always looked at as like, this is costing us money, how do we make it cheaper? You get about a three-month window that I've seen from consulting where if you get burned, you got about three months to request budget and requisition new services before everybody up high forgets about it, and then they don't care anymore. Uh. So lastly, we have the managed security space, the MSSP, Managed Security Service Providers. So that's kind of been my space for the last several years, um, both in consulting and in SOC work. That's really, I'm company A, and I don't want to hire a team. So I'm going to go to company B, and I'm going to pay you usually a smaller amount of money than if I were to hire my own team, and I'm going to outsource all of my stuff to you. You're going to be my soccer. You're going to be my consultant. So you're going to do this or that for me. Typically, those places work on lower money, but they're a services specific company. So their revenue is from providing security for other people. So they tend to be easier to get into. They tend to staff a lot, even if they do tend to have a lot of turnover. But they tend to be really good places to be from that perspective. The downside of something like that is 
you're always going to be about an inch deep and a mile wide rather than in private sector or a specific government space where you're going a mile deep. So I would say that uh, an MSSP done right is actually a, like brings a lot of value for the small and mid-market companies <laughs> that can't afford to do it on their own or, or whatever. Um, but there's always the old saying, you know, and, and you understand when you have it in-house, what's the opposite of in-house? Outhouse, right? So <laughs> just keep that in mind when, you, when you're working <laughs> with mm -hmm. outsourced kinds of things. So now we're going to get to the part that this is really about, the problems, conveniently broken down. We're doing this a couple ways. First, we're going to talk about some pre-analyst problems. These are things that happen before an event alert or something that an analyst needs to look into gets to. First problem, communication in silos. The problem of uh, getting all the data where you need to have it. So, so many people, when they set up their logging or their infrastructure, they have I call them data cartels, uh, you know, where they just kind of husband their data and they don't want to share it. It's a lot of problem there. Feel free to join me. And then, you know, it's always when you're hired as an, in as an analyst, you're always told, oh, you know, coming in, you're going to have all these uh, training opportunities. You're going to be helped out along the way. You, you can dive into whatever you want, and then you start working the jobs, and sometimes you were, you know, led down the wrong path. And you're always told, well, your job is to monitor the network. Your job is to read the, uh, respond to these emails. And sometimes you kind of feel like you're stuck in your, your swim lane as our poor Jimmy over here poor is doing. Jimmy. Poor Jimmy's getting stuck in a swim lane where he really wants to progress, but there he's always being stopped at every turn saying, well, you're, you need to do, do your job you've been hired to do. And if you want to do anything else, you need to learn that in your own time off-premises. Yeah, don't tell me it, happens, do. it happens in a lot of places, right? A lot of places that you come in, the expectation is, and from, from the business side, I understand this. The expectation is you're getting paid to do a job, so you come in and do the job, mm -hmm. right? Comma, but there's a lot of value in helping those people grow, and there's a lot of value in helping your people grow. So when you block them, when an analyst is not able to learn how things work on an engineering side, or how things work in the remediation side after they're done with something, it's going to provide gaps in their knowledge that's going to keep them from being a better analyst in the long term. And that becomes that big issue with communication and team breakdown in those silos. Yeah, so what I was going to say is a lot of the analysts I've worked with come from a different background. They're either IT guys, network guys. So what they can provide and uh, contribute is always valuable, but they're always told, hey, just stay in your lane, you know, clear your alerts. Uh, they're not allowed to interact with the CIO team or the IT team and be able to provide feedback on how to get better data into our you know, SIM or SOC, wherever you're putting it. And that's also really important to be able to get context around why things are firing in an alert. And to get that, you need to have that communication, that open channel with the ops guys or, or perhaps whoever's running that, you know, that system in finance. They may be sit, standing up something new. If you don't understand that, getting those alerts really is kind of meaningless. You're just checking the block at that point. Right. Yeah. It's contextual understanding. So... In, in the spirit of something like this and information sharing, let's talk a little bit about ways that we think you can address that. And my general thought process here, and one of the things that I've done in the past anyway, is I've had a, oh, basically a team of analysts that I would use as external support and partner support that would work with my internal guys. And in accordance with doing their own job, I would task them out, and this is stuff they wanted to do and learn. They would get tasked out to work with other teams and build formalized processes for information sharing and communication between those teams. Yeah, one of the things we try to do uh, in a lot of the stocks we work in is get the IT guys to come sit in with us and see how we do what we do. So they start to understand our purpose and our mission in there, and then they're, bu they're buying in on this, and then they're more apt to help you when you need a new data set you know, sent in. And it's also really important to make sure that you have a – a good security engineering team that can help bake into the processes to your configuration management processes and your, uh, your CRBs configuration review boards. Make sure that security is baked into that process so that when it, when the system gets turned on for the first time, the logs that you need are, are pre-identified and you don't have to find out, oh, wait a minute, there's a new sys, syslog server out there. What's it doing? Where, Where's it coming from? You don't have to chase that down. And that's where the communications, having that open dialogue, so often people are in their own silos where they just don't have that opportunity to, to get out of it. And this is where some of the junior analysts, you can send them on 
expeditions. Go out there and, you know, find out what's happening downrange. You know, you know, give them some time to get out there and learn about the company or the organization that they're supporting. And that way, when those alerts fire, they have some context around what's happening. Yeah, exactly. So when that's typically what I, I like to push for. Typically, I get always get stuck in those silos where you're stuck in that swim lane. But I, I hate it. I always want to learn more. And as I, as I progress through my career within that company, I always push for cross training opportunities, especially when you move into the more senior analysts within the SOC, shift lead, stuff like that. I like to bring in the engineers. I like to bring in the migrations teams and the PMs so they can cross train with the analysts to see what they're doing, especially when in the private sector, when you have just the engineering team and you have the networking team and then you have the SOC. Sometimes there's like a breakdown of communication between the three where they don't really know what each of them are doing and having the opportunity to be, as an analyst to go sit with the engineers to see like how the, the, the sensors are configured or, or the networking team see how everything's run and just having that 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 let's say cornucopia of knowledge is important as an analyst so you can understand not only your network but what everyone else is doing to support that network as well and, and tying that back to the to the to the prior uh, discussion, that's going to be different in an MSSP versus a public sector or versus a a uh, government uh, kind of environment. You gotta there's different environments where we'll be able to feed that information better than more and different more. information that you're going to have. Mm -hmm. So right. let's talk about information a little bit. Actually, that sounds like a good segue. That's a very good segue. I love a good segue. I really do. I'm there for you, man. It's like we Thank practices you. or something. So up next, getting good data to an analyst. This is a really big one, and I believe you yeah, want to go is a here. Big, this is a big issue. So a lot of times uh, you go out, you start building a SOC, you get all your data in, but you have no context as where the data came from. And then an analyst is looking at an alert that fires, and they're like, okay, I need these other three pieces of data. Well, sometimes it takes months or even years to get that data to an analyst if it's not configured from the beginning. Uh, so one of the things you have to do is put value on your data. Uh, when you get the buy-in from the IT team, let them know how important that data is to your analyst to be able to dig down and get into uh, whether it be NetFlow PCAP, full PCAP, log data from endpoints, whatever it is they need. You have to get that buy-in from your IT team to be able to get that over to your SOC. Yeah, you're going to want to definitely get that buy-in. You're also, you know, if you can be there in the planning stages, you know, the of, of the of whatever you know system that's being deployed, whether it's a new web services or um, you know, server or something like that. Getting that buy-in early, you know, defining your requirements. Again, I'm going to go back to the security engineering part of it, making sure that all of those are defined. And some of them are defined in compliance standards. Anybody have to deal with NIST 853? Just, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all defined in there. Now, granted, that's not going to be everything you ever need. But, I mean, it, it, at least it's a ground rule that when they're designing and building these things, you could say, here's your compliance standards, whether it's that or Cramley's Bliley or HIPAA or whatever, those things are predefined if you can get them to buy in on that. However, if you're MSSP and you're working with some auto dealership out there, probably credit cards maybe, right. you know, credit. Um, PCI but, compliance. So, yeah. so that's, that's a really important point, right? So one of these really important points that exists in this space, and one of the reasons why we kind of broke down different sectors of different types of socks too, is because getting good data to an analyst, and we'll probably cover this a little bit later, but it involves knowing what your mission is. Yep. You have to know what your mission is to know what data is good data. Yeah, for example, like we, well, one of the contract I was working on in the government, somebody was insisting on importing all of syslog data out of all the Windows machines. They said, we need it, we need it, we need it. You need to figure out how to get it to the analysts. We're like, but why? They're like, well, we just need it. So why is that going to be good data for the analysts? Well, so-and-so said it should, should be done. We're like, you know how much data that is going to be over a single hour of traffic? Oh, no, uh, uh, like 50,000 host network. That's why from the MSSP side, when you go in, and this doesn't always happen. It really doesn't. When you go into a client, one of the first questions that you ask that client is, what is it that you care about? What are you trying to protect? And this is true if you go into any job. What is it that matters to you? If I can take what it is that matters to you, I can then define what data that I need to use to make sure that I get you the results that you need. And we'll cover that a bit more later, but it's kind of relevant here yeah. too. Anybody else have anything else on this one or should we go? Well, we can talk a little bit. So tools and technology are another big thing too. Yep. Yeah. How many people are at places with old technology? Sims specifically, by the way. Sims are a big deal. Every, everybody's got a sim. 
Barely anybody sets them up or keeps them set up right. Yeah, no, no one <laughs> maintains no one, the filters, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, tuning, yeah, one, one regular maintenance. Into, uh, one place I walked into had a uh, twelve-year-old Sam that hadn't been touched in five or six years, and uh, so when we took over, we we're trying to get some new filters built, and the uh, the company said it'd be six months to build a single filter. I mean, that's not efficient for anybody. So. Yeah. Stuff or like you that. have to reset, re, uh, reboot the sim every every other day because the database overflows. Yeah, that's always good. <laughs> and those kinds of problems aren't that uncommon either. Unfortunately, those are the kind of problems that there's very little that an, somebody at an analyst level can really do to fix. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the analyst a little bit. Yeah. Do it to it. Lack of staffing and expertise. I'm sure this is one that almost everybody feels in every side of computer security. We lack staffing. We lack expertise. That's a big thing. Has anybody broken the code on how to recruit junior analysts? Please let us know. Yeah. So <laughs> that would it's be great. Getting getting them in at the right, you know, money. Getting, <laughs> yeah, it's money. It's money. But then then the money you pay your analyst is going to come out of some other bucket from somewhere else in the commercial world. And then you, there's the 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 drive of that junior analyst. Do they really do they just want to sit around and collect the paycheck or do they actually want to learn? All right. And so finding those folks. So um, you know, Forgot where I was going with this. It's the gray hair. It filters everything. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> uh, well, the, and yes, absolutely. Um, I come across the entry level analysts recently that can't get a job because they don't have experience. Oh, yeah, well, interesting. It's a big problem. Like everybody wants to buy, they want cheap, but they don't want zero experience. Yeah. That's that's that, that is I a big thing. A lot of time, you. we do see that a lot. But as a more senior analyst, you come in, you have the five, six, ten years experience. You don't have a problem getting a job. But that's one of the things that we would, like. I like to push, like when the hiring managers, they we always need people. There's always a seat that needs to be filled, and they don't they don't you know they don't have experience. But most of the time, I know personally when I interview somebody, I don't care how much experience you have. It's about how you think and what your drive is to learn. And sometimes you have the people that can fool you, but sometimes you meet people that are truly interested in learning. And that's the biggest thing I run into is, you know, you have somebody right out of college. They might come in as an intern or they might come in off of a recruiter and just learning to, you know, t talking with them, having that communication with them so you can figure out their mindset, what they want to do and how they think is, is a key thing is don't I think go in knowing everything. I think we still have a little bit of old market method mentality, yes, right? right? There's having a job to a lot of bosses is a privilege. Yeah. You're in a good position because I employ you and you should be thankful for that. But guess what? We're in DC and it's cybersecurity. There's way more jobs than there are people to fill them. So that mentality absolutely has to change because it's not hard to go somewhere else. All the way in the back in the green. So the question is, is how involved, before you hire someone, how involved do you need to be with the hiring manager in setting the requirements? Is that, that the question? Yeah. So I'm going to say that you need to be intimately involved. You, you need to understand what the, you know, what the requirements of the job are before you go start casting the net. And then you need to be able to spell them out for the hiring manager and have them go out there and pre-screen these things because there's nothing worse having hired people than sitting there and interviewing people who are obviously not qualified for the job and you don't know, understand how they got there. Or even spending time with a resume, you know, the hiring manager is looking for the word analyst and suddenly <laughs> you get some business analyst who's submitted a resume. Well, that's not the kind of analyst I'm looking for. And then so the other, you, gotta, you really got to educate them. The other half of the problem, though, really, isn't just the job description. It's that more often than not, at least where I've been, they don't even define the levels of the analyst for the people doing the job. Yeah. Nobody knows the difference between the junior and the senior. And I'm not saying that you should put up walls. That's the communications and silos thing. Don't wall people off. But what I've done is you define a system where junior analyst, this is my clear cut expectations. You are welcome to do more. You are welcome to do the intermediate analyst expectations. And when you check off all those marks, well, it's really time to look at about, about getting you a promotion. Whether or not I can do that, not always my choice, but I'm looking to move people from one to another to another. I love hiring juniors, but until you define internally what your roles mean, you can't really hire externally for them. And you teach your, your recruiters. You ha I, I've actually talked to recruiters who cold called me 
for an, a business analyst position because there's a word analyst in my resume, I've actually talked to recruiters and taught them what a security analyst is and what to look for for a position that they're trying to hire within the security world, and that's quite key. You have another question? Go ahead, Joe. Eight hundred one eighty one special publication. So Falco, it, repeating it for the folks, uh, the recording is yeah. finding a way to quantify the skills necessary for analysts that are already in writing. I'm familiar with one eighty one, and that's in this publication. If you've not seen it, it's really neat. It breaks it down. Um, the key performance indicators, uh, well, KSA's kills uh, kills skills. Something, something, something. Knowledge. There you go. KSAs. It's all broken down if you've not seen that in this publication. The other thing you can go into is uh, I've had uh, dealings with is the Department of Labor wage um, surveys. You, it will tell you what a particular job is worth in every market, which is kind of neat if you've not seen that. At one point in my career in the civilian sector, I was hiring security guards, and what you pay a security guard in Miami is different than what you pay in Los Angeles. Well, I'm sure it's the same with security analysts, Department of Labor wage surveys. Uh, and then that will help your recruiters to quantify and, and cull out folks. You don't want to hire a 200K a year person for an entry level job. And that can, you know, that's part of that. So if you guys don't mind holding for just a few minutes too, we do have to get through quite a bit more, although I love the questions. I really do. I think I just want to make sure we're good on time. The one, two, three, four, yeah. five. Because we still got to talk a little bit about expertise, and that becomes another big problem. Once you get in your junior analyst, how do you get them expertise? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Send them to B sides yeah. was the comment. We we promote a lot of this uh this community here. I tell all the analysts uh Get involved in the community, get involved in unallocated, get involved in B-sides, go present, because I tell you what, if you want to present, you learn a lot trying to get ready for that. Um, and if you got the money, send them to some good courses. Obviously, SANS is a great courses. There's a bunch of online resources, though, that are free. And, you know, I encourage analysts to spend some time, if you have time at work, to give them a couple hours a week to go do something online uh, that's free resource. And I, then mentor them in that process. Yeah, Let them go, you know. You give them some latitude within the scope of their job to experiment, to explore, as long as they don't break anything. Yeah. Go out there and they can start pulling on the thread, as I call it. You know, I, there's, you know, they're working these binary alerts. It happened or it didn't. Well, let them go in there and start pulling on the thread and trying to figure out what exactly took place underneath the covers. That will help develop the, the skill and expertise inside and also keep them motivated. Yeah, and when you hire in a new new junior analyst, you know, typically the senior, you have the, the senior analysts who are designated to train, and then there's senior analysts that are willing to train, and then there's a senior analyst that don't want anything to do with anybody talking to them. They just want to do their job and get out for the day. I think there's also the senior analyst that doesn't have time to train. Well, that's the thing. They don't have to have time. But you, you know, you might not have the time, but you can always let them watch. And if they have a question, you don't, you, you know, your senior, as a senior analyst, as a more senior person, be a mentor. If you see a junior come in and out of college and they don't have the faintest clue what you're doing, but they're interested. That's the biggest thing. You have the juniors that want to just come in and click that button every day and go home with a paycheck. Sometimes you have junior analysts come in, they, they have that drive. You can definitely pick up on it during the interview. And within the first couple of weeks, they, they, they're wide eyed. They're really scared, but they don't know what they're doing. But you need to reach out to them as a senior, be like, Hey, you know, what are you doing? Give them the training that they need. Uh, you know, give them some packets, let them work on some stuff, let them shoulder surf you. And then you send them off. You answer their questions. But most of the time, some juniors come in, they're terrified to talk to the seniors. And sometimes even the mid-level, because we have our headphones on, noise cans, and we're listening to our music, we're just head down working. And so I'm going to segue off one of those yeah. points, but I am going to say to his earlier point, because I do hire people occasionally, um, I look for people who do things like B-sides or hacker spaces or anything that they do in their own time. Because that, to me, shows me that they have a certain interest and a motivation Staff motivation. Boom. Yeah, oh. Enthusiasm is contagious. And so this kind of segues in. If you are enthusiastic about your job, it's very easy to have the juniors around you um, to be enthusiastic about their job. 
Um, and it's, it's really important that for the seniors in the room not to lose that sense of wonder and awe at what you're doing every day. Um, keep up that motivation. Keep coming to training. Keep get, keep asking questions. If you're only there answering questions, if you're going to work bored every day, that will be contagious and that will emanate down. If you go to work and you get up every morning and you go, oh, I gotta go to work, then you're in the wrong line of work. Bottom line. If you're not there, if you're not enthusiastic, then that will just permeate throughout a team. Yeah, I get up every morning. I love my job because every day is different, right? So I always look for something in that day that I can take away and uh, it keeps me motivated. And I know that helps. Like you said, it's contagious. Mm -hmm. If you're up and you're bright eyed, bushy tail, ready to go every morning, everybody around you will be the same. It's very contagious. But if you come in, you know, moaning and growing, yep. everybody else will too. And, and that works up as well. So if you're working for bosses who are not enthusiastic, have enthusiasm, show that initiative, either then you're in a poisonous environment and you should move, or you can encourage that enthusiasm, just kind of asking questions uh, in ways that get people motivated to, to help you find those answers. Yeah, pretty much. It's, just just take care of your, you know, as a senior, you know, just have the enthusiasm to teach, to do low learn, stuff like that. It's important to know that motivation is different for every single person. Every yeah. one of you in this room, I'm sure, has something different that motivates you in some way. A, a key is when you're interviewing, look for managers that have some sense of empathy that will actually figure out what it is that motivates you so that you can figure out how they will try to line that up with what they need from you. Because some people are going to be motivated by learning more and intelligence. Some people are going to be motivated, motivated by having impact. Some people want to be recognized. People, different things move different people. And that's important to know as an analyst too. The guy sitting next to you doing the same job may have a completely different set of motivators for him. And if you can understand those, you can much easier, you can, it's much easier to explain why people are the way they are and how they work. Wow. That's a great point, Sean. Thank you. See what I did there? I want to, uh, I want to flip this around a little bit too. If you're out looking for a job as an analyst, this is, these are very important things to ask your, your, whoever's, uh, interviewing you. Like, how long have people stayed with the company? What do you do Absolutely. to help motivate people to stay? Is there a package of training? Is there a package for traveling out and going to these conferences? Some companies pay for people to come to conferences. That's awesome. If you're leaving, if you're going to a company, you can always ask, so who am I replacing and why did they leave? Oh, that's because they thought I was a toxic boss. Well, I won't many, tell you that. How, how many how many times has that happened? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or they talk about how you know if you know the previous person left because they were overwhelmed, they had to work too many tickets, or they, they too much was expected out of them. Yeah. Burnout. Yeah, burnout. That's man. a big part of this motivation thing. I mean, yep. there was just a study that, and I you sent it to me, and I can't remember the name of it for the life of me now. I called it Bob, but there was just a study that came out talking about general analyst burnout. I've been in shops where analysts would work anywhere from one to five or, you know, uh, one ticket every one to five minutes. Like, that's an incredible burnout rate, right? Like, that's a lot of work and not a lot of time to actually dig in and do some analysis. And burnout, I think, is one of the biggest things we have. And if I remember correctly, that study stated, or another one that I read, that a general analyst, when they queried, said that they're comfortable doing seven to eight alarms a day. So if you're going for an analyst job, Here's a, here's a fun question to ask during the interview. How many alarms am I going to be expected to work a day? What's the average day look like from an alarm count perspective? Am I going to have time to dig or am I just opening and closing tickets? Yep. Anybody have anything else to talk about for motivation? Questions on that? Anybody? Yeah, Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. Um, the way that we fix all the unhappy people is to fire them and then we'll only have happy people. <laughs> that was it, yeah. That was on the slide. So what are we talking about? What, what's that? So now we go into post-analysts. Metrics misunderstandings. This, this is a big one for everybody, I'm sure, right? Because everybody has to find a way, especially when you get into the financial side and the business side, there's got to be a way to justify your people. How do you measure success? Yeah, how do you measure your, your yeah. So uh, I was asked by a CEO one time, how many bad guys did you guys catch this year with your stock, right? Uh, the answer was zero, and he didn't like that answer. He's like, well, then you have enough staff. Uh, actually, if I had more staff, I might have caught the one or two bad guys I didn't catch that I know were there, right? There's, it's, uh, it's numbers. They always want to know how many tickets you're clearing, how many alarms you're clearing. 
Um, and that's a big deal. Yeah, it's always about numbers of tickets you're clearing. It's, it's, not, it's like the graph says, you know, Jimmy closed the most tickets. He he's must the be the best. But you have, you have poor Brian. He's just not so good. And you have uh, Erica and Steve. They're all right. And, you know, typically in the private sector, you always have to have the justification for the cost. Well, how many tickets did you clear? How many tickets did you open and escalate? How many tickets went out to the customer? Well, the, So the, another the fun interview question when you're interviewing for a job how do you run metrics on analysts? Yeah. That's a really good thing to know when you're going in because that's going to tell you, is it a shop where the person who closes the most tickets gets the best? Don't get me wrong. I've been an analyst. I've gamed the hell out of that system. I've yeah. done less work than everybody and looked like I did more. And yeah. probably everybody at some point has done that. Sometime at night, you're just sitting there working the overnight shift and you're just like, I know all these 400 alerts are the same. Ah, uh, closed. Okay. I'll go back to YouTube or something along those lines. So, so my approach at metrics is a little different. Maybe it's because I'm an analyst. Metrics are like an alert. They are an investigation springboard to ask additional questions. So in this instance, Brian closed the least tickets. Did Brian escalate more tickets? Are Brian's tickets higher quality? Do I need to talk to Brian maybe and see if something's going on? What can I get? And it's way more than just ticket closures that when I run a metric, I run ticket closures, I run escalations, I run percentages, I run basis on shift. I pull all the data, look at the data like an analyst, and then know what questions to ask next. Time from uh, time from open till close, too, is another big thing. Is Brian could have the least amount of tickets, but he only worked three tickets a day, but it, it took him three hours to open that ticket and then come to a status change, at least. But Jimmy's wor opening a ticket in his 36 seconds to status change. Right. It could be three or four mi like hours, but you know, Brian's the least amount of tickets open, so obviously he's the worst, but he's actually digging in and looking into things. Always understand what kind of metrics you have when you're going into a new shop, though. Understand what they're going to value you on. If there's a minimum ticket count a day and stuff like that. Yep. Question? So, what percentage of uh, metrics do you use to identify the flaws that are built into the system as an example? A new program comes on and it's now doing errors. So the question is, what percentage and how do you measure system metrics? New systems coming online, old systems getting patched, rather than people metrics. And you can do that through general alert metrics, which is one way, if those systems are actually forwarding in alerts. And you can use that data to let you know what you're looking for from a tuning perspective or from a correction perspective. Anybody else have thoughts here? No. No, I'm good. <laughs> no. Specifically uh, on so, analyst time. So Perfect. how much do false positives figure into the uh, the analyst's you know grade, basically? Right. Oh, that that sounds like well, you have to identify them as false positives first, right? And then then that would imply some level of senior analyst, more senior analysts going through and grading the the alerts that came in potentially afterwards, or perhaps a, a junior analyst nominating something to be a false positive. That could also be a, a metric that you could apply for the junior analysts. How many false positives did they recommend for tuning? Um, mm -hmm. And that could be something that they are graded on as well. That um, is a metric that I pulled. There's what? That is a metric that I pulled at places. Oh, there you How go. many That's tuning it. requests we submitted? Right. And so, what platforms those were for? Right. So what he said. So to go into the last part of this, metrics ultimately come down to how an organization demonstrates ROI. Metrics become the numbers that define the numbers, which are the money. And the money is what's important. So how do we demonstrate ROI? This is quite possibly my favorite of the funny slides, by the way. So oh boy. demonstrating ROI, that's a big deal. That's going to be probably less of a big deal in government. Yeah. But MSSP and private sector, big one, big deal. They're going to do that from a metric perspective. So what can an analyst do to, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just be straight about it, game the system. Understand their metrics, understand what they care about, and you can totally game the system. You might disagree with it, and if you disagree with it, it might be time to go. It might be time to find a better system. I wouldn't recommend 
gaming a system. Perhaps they could also recommend improvements to the system, um, but going in there and finding a return on investment, uh, that, that is quite the challenge, Dustin. Yeah, so um, in the government space, they always want to buy the next newest, biggest, baddest blinky box, right? And they want to spend millions of dollars on this blinky box, and then they want to hire two people to watch the blinky box. And I'm, you know, I go and I'm, I think you're going to need 10 or 12 analysts. They hire two. So what did you just do? You spent all this money on a blinky box that tells you all these cool things, but you have nobody to look at it, right? So ROI for me, what's important is uh, scoping what you're going to do, getting the right people, and I recommend a lot of times using commodity hardware and building open source, you know, cheaper products, but you have people that are invested into it because they're the ones building uh, your sock. They're the ones building all these data points for you, building the analytics, and that's much more valuable than a Blinky box. Okay. Or they, or they spend. In my opinion, all the vendors that sell Blinky boxes, I'm sorry. Or they, or they, or they spend half the money. They, 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 they buy just enough Blinky boxes to just barely cover the network. Right. And don't expect. As a expansion. side note, we recommend all the Blinky boxes of people who sponsor this show. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, buy all the sponsors Blinky boxes. Well, there's a place for them, right? Yeah. yeah there's a place for them. Um, the problem is, is when you buy a two million dollar Blinky box, uh, you're going to need another million dollars in. Uh, to the company for your tail, right? Well, this goes back to, to earlier. Built. Like, way earlier, we talked about defining your mission. Right. You can't demonstrate your return on investment unless you define your mission. So if you haven't been given a clear mission, that's something I encourage people to push for. What is my true goal here? What is it that you expect of me? Is it to find bad guys? Is it to close tickets? Whatever the case may be, however brutal that is, define your mission and then you can demonstrate your return on investment by whether or not you're meeting that mission. If, uh, if the organization is buying a $2 million blinky box without talking to the SOC about what it needs, there's your, pro it there's your problem right there. It definitely happens. You need to, you, you know, if they're just pushing security appliances down, uh, that's the untenable situation. But more AI. More technology. Oh, my but God. All the AIs. AIs. Yeah, well, I got all the AIs. Yeah, sure. No, but it, I mean... That's and that goes back to the, the going back to the communication. If you don't understand what the organization needs, you don't understand what drives their decision process. You can't influence it. And if you're in a position, if you're running a sock or you're working in a sock and you're being presented with blinky boxes that you have to monitor and you weren't part of the decision process, then something is fundamentally broken there. And you really need to be. And then that's an opportunity for you then to go quantify what your awareness is or your your perception of what's going on to management who because you have such a great environment because everybody's enthusiastic right i'm tying it all together here oh, there you all go. right so you know then you have this good communication back and forth um and, and get in front of it you know if you hear somebody because generally they don't just go out and buy a blinky box they you hear that that these things are potentially coming down the pike have that conversation with your management. If your management doesn't understand why you need or don't need a new blinky box, then you know th then it's up to you to educate them on why. And then if I you agree. don't know what the blinky box does, push to get trained on it so you don't just get ah, handed something. Training. So that you have that training and the certification and retention. Yes. So a little bit of motivation. Tying that yeah. back in there. Look at that, how that works. Yeah, th this kind of all full circles, really. And while we broke this down, what we're really demonstrating is that every one of these, this is a very secular thing. Like, and everybody's got to be on the level. Engineers have to be on level with analysts, and the people who lead the analysts and lead the business need to be on level with them, too. Everybody's got to know what's going on, and it comes back to the first thing we talked about, communication. Yes. Everybody's got to be able to, to ex have that communication. How many people in here think they're good communicators? Yeah, that's not a lot of hands. It's not a lot of hands. How many people in here has this, will this directly affect in some way, by the way? Like, do soccer analyst work? That's a couple more hands than last year, I think. So, we wanted to do this kind of from a community perspective, and it's B-sides. So, we actually did submit, we had a few questions submitted that we can go over, but we're actually doing way better on time than I thought we were going to do. We can talk slower. So, no, no, way we better on time sing. means more time for questions, which means we can cover what's important to you guys individually. So, right. absolutely my favorite scene. So, one of our online questions was, do we think that there's more rabbit holes than there are analysts? That was one of the online questions. Yes. 
<laughs> and that was not rehearsed. No, it really wasn't. Yeah, yeah there's absolutely. I mean, I mean and, that, and that goes back towards the depth of level of investigation you want to pursue. You know, do you just want to close a ticket or do you want to figure out why the underlying pro thing occurred? And, you know, that goes to the enthusiasm and the curiosity of the individual who's charged with identifying and triaging these things. Yeah, we have the awesome uh, capability in our systems. We let our, even our junior analysts go all the way down to the root cause, right? I want them to go all the way down. And then the senior guys mentor and help them get to the right places. But um, there's definitely a ton of rabbit holes. And sometimes you got to reach over and pull your buddy out because yeah. they're digging too deep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They go start reading a blog. They're like, oh, we're going to find this. And all of a sudden they find like an indicator somewhere that in the traffic. They're like, oh, this could be, we're, we're, we've been popped. And, no, that's. You found the uh, an A B hex. It was an A V. Yeah. <laughs> so you're fine. So just side note: signatures fire on antivirus. Yeah. <laughs> you say A B. <laughs> so the other one, and it was further down the the rabbit theme. And was it was Peter Cottontail? I don't know. I don't know. Chicken Little. Chicken, chicken Little. little. There, there we go. Uh, yes. Well, yeah. Well, the yes. person. Do we think there's a uh, Chicken Little between analysts and like C levels, technical people and C levels? What? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> the sky is definitely the sky falling is every falling. time. Oh yeah, and that and that happens a lot when you have a very enthusiastic junior analyst. Mm -hmm. um, they will definitely see the sky falling, and it's up to us as the more senior folks to to help mentor and guide them in the right direction. Uh, you know, just constantly, constantly. Oh my gosh, look at this! It's happening, um, and it it can be a great distraction for the entire team. Because you not only need to walk them back from the edge, but explain to them why they're standing too close to the edge for something that's really not really even an edge. It but goes it's also, the other way, It's also too. the other way, especially in the government, does, because yes. you could have a, a GS listening to the NPR in the morning. He hears a, an article, and all of a sudden he walks into the office, oh, my word, we're going to be hacked. Oh, my yeah. word. We've and been called in after hours for something that came out on a Twitter feed. Uh, the whole team got called in. We have to patch this right now. We're vulnerable to all these things. Uh, and we go and look and we're absolutely not. But it, it happens. But that's why you need to watch those Twitter feeds and be in front of those things. I've, I've had a couple of times where something pops on Twitter or, you know, some new report is put out about some new vulnerability. And we get ahead of it before the boss comes in. And you can be, you know, you can start, you know, preloading those answers. I, I've learned that, you know, whoever gets to the boss first wins. Yes. So if you can get to the boss, hey, you're going to see this news feed coming out. Your boss may ask about it. Here's what our status is. You'll be appreciated more, and and it makes your boss look good because they're in front of the issue that, that the CEO might be pushing down and asking about. Yeah, we also get some external alerts, So some some especially in government sector. There's other people monitoring stuff you're doing other places. Um, and our COO uh, one time got an external alert. And he thought the world was on fire. Um, but once we looked at our data, we saw it was just a false positive. Well, that is something that we didn't really discuss about. As, as an analyst, stay on top of data. Yes. Stay on top of the news feeds. Stay on top of the, the blog posts, all the Twitter. Just stay ahead. Never stop learning. That's something that you need to do is never stop staying ahead of like the curve. But there's so much out there, it's hard. It, it's very hard, but you've got to try. Don't ever try to become a master at one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just stay ahead of the curve. So now's probably a good time to open it up for questions. And if anybody would be comfortable actually walking up and speaking into the mic so we can get it on the recording, that would be the best. If not, we can repeat back. We can repeat we can questions. Repeat we can repeat. We got a question in the back? Go ahead. He's coming up. So how fudgeable is, and I'm going to hit the first one first, and then we'll do the other ones because I'm going to forget them. How fudgeable is a SOC analyst from one SOC to another? And honestly, that's completely up to the it analyst. It depends. It really does because it, SOCs are so different. Every one is so different. Yeah. I've been in intense hunt SOCs. I've been in, you know, two inches deep SOCs. So no, I guess the answer is it's not very fungible unless you can find two very similar socks. That would be my take. I mean, you, it right. depends it's, on your your, your your drive to learn new 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 uh, go into a place that's completely different. You have the skill set deep down, but you make the move over to a different sock that has 
your, your requirements at one SOC was, oh, I just need to respond to emails. Then you move into another SOC where you are from start to finish the person handling that event. It doesn't matter what level you are. So here's the better question. Do you really want to move to another SOC and do the same thing? Or do you want to move to another SOC and have do something better or more or something that you haven't done before? So um, another part of your question, I believe, was onboarding. How long? So uh, one environment I work in, there's about a six-month soak where you're just learning the environment. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be doing things. You're going to be clearing alerts. You're going to be doing things. But we, we average about six months before you actually grasp the network and how it works. So yeah, that, it's that's pretty crazy. We also, though, uh, where I am, we have a, a two- or three-day kind of getting-to-know-you training protocol where the new SOC analysts come in and they – they learn a little, they get the network diagram, they get, you know, where sensors are, things like that, and we train them on that. And then there's actually, I'm, I'm working with some junior military now, there's a certification process where they get to sit before a board and kind of recite some of the things that, you know, make sure that they're, they're eligible to work on the watch floor solo. And what was the middle question? Best practices for dealing with shift work in a 24 by 7 sock? Uh, don't make it your graveyard for the people you don't like. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, because that, that's, it needs to be rotating shifts can, you know, it, there's, it's a two edged sword. Um, you, you have people who like working the night shift. Um, and if they're effective in that position, great. Let them do it. Uh, if they're not, then you, you're going to need to find other places for them. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah, work, working a rotating shift in a sock can definitely lead to, lead to burnout pretty quickly because, you know, you have somebody that works, what, four weeks on days, and next thing you know, you have to work four weeks on nights. You, your body never has the time to adjust, and then if it's on a rotating schedule like that, you're just constantly in flux. And as an analyst, it, it definitely wears, wears you out, and you just you start to lose that motivation because next thing you know, like, oh, well, then you lose a day, and then you're trying to recoup the – you work overnight during the weekend, and the weekends you're waking up at 9 a.m. to go out with your friends or with your wife or whatever. So my thing goes back to communication. So one of the one of the hazards of the off shifts, and mm -hmm. you and I at least have worked several off shifts, and we know that one of the big hazards of working that off shift is you feel like you're stuck on an island and alone. Yeah. yeah. So the been. the sock that I was just running, by the way, I'm employed unemployed until tomorrow, so that's fun. <laughs> the sock that I was just running was 27 people, five shifts, 24 by seven. And my big thing was I was on at least one turnover every week and at least online across every shift a couple times a week. So if anybody needed something, I was available and they could ask questions and they had a line to their management staff yeah. to make sure that they knew what was going on instead of hearing everything secondhand and feeling lost because I've been there. And that's the sucks. biggest. That's probably one of the hardest things when you work on an evening shift. The bosses leave at 5 o'clock or earlier and then you're there until 11 o'clock at night, or you work an overnight shift, you feel like you're just sitting there and you have no management, you have no one to talk to, and all you do is you get emails down or in the, from upper management where you just don't feel like you have any way out. And then if then it comes time to changing that shift, you really want to move down to a, a daylight shift so you can feel like a normal human being again. And um, you just you, the only, the only inter interaction you have with your actual management is if you want to stay after Especially if you work overnight, you want to stay after for four hours waiting for them to come in at 9 a.m. when you get off at 6. So more questions? I know you do, and I know you do. Anybody else? We, we got I'm, I support your questions. What do you got? Small, medium, what size business? 50-ish person business? And the question is... Where do you need a SOC as opposed to skilled IT professionals? And that's a really good question, actually. And I would probably say like a 50-person company, right? You're probably looking at a 9 to 5 fairly skilled security team, two, three people maybe, Tops. getting alerts at night. Like you're going to be up if something happens and you're going to have that stuff forwarding to you. But, I mean, you're looking at a two to three person staff to manage how, something How big like is that. the IT department? Two yeah, to three people. There we go. That's I, a I, yeah, I, I, I see a perfect opportunity for crossover because if it's a commercial entity, you're going to have a hard time justifying additional headcount to deal with just security stuff when it's all like, is the business IT related? Okay. You could say that? Okay. So 
So if it was like a car dealership or something, you'd be hard pressed to deal with, to, you know, to justify that additional cost to the management. If you're an IT group, it's not hard to sell what the threats are and the vulnerabilities are. So um, if it is just internally, well, that's uh, where MSSPs make their bread yeah, and butter, yeah, right there. They can, yep. they can, you can just become part of the status quo of an MSSP, and you just pay that yearly fee, and then you just, as the IT people, they just receive the email or the phone call from the MSSP saying, "Hey, you have this going on. Fix it, just so you know." That's the general target of an MSSP. Yep. So, right. qu more. Next question. Don't be shy right. now. We're fairly friendly. Four we got four minutes. We got we four got minutes until lunch minutes. starts, but we can go as long as we want to. I mean, you know. Joe, you can. You, you, I'll, I'll take another one from you. I know you got them. So here's a hard question. How uh -oh. many Every one of them. How many red teams <laughs> have you All got? of the above. <laughs> they, they let us know that they're going to come in and uh, red team the network, so it's just like, oh, watch out for the red yeah. team this week. It we tends it tends to be hit or miss, and I'll be honest, a lot of my analysts will be like, oh, that's a pen testing team. I'm just not going to alert that because they don't care. Yeah, they, they let us know that the pen, the pen testers are going to be running you know, activities on the network, and we're supposed to catch them. Okay, the tool saw this happen. It's got the, it's got the watermark of the, of, the, of the red team. I'll write up one, send it up the chain, and then they're like, okay, cool, you caught them. And most of the time, it's most of the time the red team's doing things just to you know test vulnerabilities on the network to help out with you know protecting the network. But as an analyst, it's just an annoyance sometimes because you're like, really, guys, really? I mean, you have to be able to paint a. Is it our job now. to catch the red team, or is it our job to catch actual attackers? Yeah. Well, if you catch a red team, you test your tools a little bit. But yeah, we've we've been on a couple of tests where we didn't know they were there. Um, they fired up a scanner or something and. All of a sudden, my dashboard blew up, and I said, "What's going on?" <laughs> yeah, you know, and oh, there's guys in the other office. They're testing you right now. Good, so it works. Uh, great. Now, can you tell them to stop, please? <laughs> Go ahead. Given that average detect time is measured in months and not minutes or hours, what do you gain with the 24 by 7 operations? I mean, I, I think I, it depends on what you're protecting, right? There's some uh, socks that run that protect really important stuff. Um, and then there's socks that run that try to make sure your, you know, PII stuff's not getting leaked out or something. Yeah, but a lot the data of it, has a lot to do with it. You, a lot of it is the PII. I, I worked in the credit card business for a while, and they watched carefully, very carefully, you know, things that look like credit card numbers crossing the wire where they weren't supposed to be. And you work for private sector companies who have very sought after, you know, prototypes, information. You have to have people there making sure that there's not a, an actor or a group out there trying to steal that data from you to, you know, essentially get, get to the market first. And having people monitoring for suspicious activity Especially large sums of data leaving the network. Big one. Is, is, is a huge thing because if you don't have somebody sitting there on a Sunday morning at 6 a.m., you know, somebody across the ocean could be in the network actively exfiltrating data and you, you it, it might not alert because they've found a way around your alerting tools, but you can still see large amounts of data leaving the network if you're monitoring you, for that. You also gain protection for low hanging fruit. And I can tell you from consulting, and probably about a hundred different cases, most of the breaches that I went in on were low-hanging fruit. It was email. Almost always email. Oh, yeah. Or credential theft. It's always something like that. So the 24 by 7 gives you early access and early visibility into the things that will hurt you but not destroy you necessarily. Because you can watch uh, Emotet is a really good example, and I know Jessica was talking about it in the keynote. The spreader module, I've watched that spread through a network in two hours and take out 160 out of 250 hosts before. So if you can catch that early, you can stop it early and not end up having downtime for four or five days. Well, well prime example, as a junior analyst working in MSSP, sitting there, it was a Saturday afternoon, headline news is on the TV, and all of a sudden we see something about like a here you have virus come across the network. And next thing you know, you look at the, you're looking at the SIM, and all of a sudden you just start seeing red alerts just start popping up, and it's just like one customer to the next, to the next, to the next, and then you're like, it's all email. 
and it's all here you have. Wow. Got to get some people on the corner on yeah. this one. And it was a sun, it was a Saturday afternoon. So there is value to the 24-7 sock. Which is, do you have a question? That was also Emmett, a really good question. I like it, Thank man. you. Thanks. Emma, do you have a question? Oh, it's she's ready for o'clock. lunch. Emma says it's one o'clock. It's time for us. So then, then let me let me pose the question: Is everyone ready for lunch? Yes, because I'm sure you are. Uh, if you, Thank you. if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to come yeah. talk to we're us. We're gonna hang around bit. out there for a little bit. If you have questions, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their time at B sides, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you.